Let's get real, security is incredibly hard. And it doesn't matter what type of security that you do. It doesn't matter if you're application security, network security, product security. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you have to track. And as you're tracking all of these things, and your, your entire day is basically taken up by doing all of this stuff, you have to constantly be prioritizing. And when you're prioritizing this stuff, the question is, is what's the biggest priority that you have? And so as security people, the thing that I've started noticing is, is that we optimize the wrong thing. What we need to be doing is, we need to figure out what the majority of, uh, where the majority of our efforts should be focused in order to optimize that one specific uh, part. And this is where I start thinking about, what about all of these third party libraries? So here's a quick question that I want you to think about. I want you to think about the applications that are currently under your management. Um, how are you tracking all right, how are you keeping track and how are you updating all of their third party libraries? How are you patching that stuff? Before you answer that question, we'll be right back to this, okay? So let's take a step back first. So the title of this talk is called Building Your House on Sand. And uh, where does that kind of come from? So it comes from this parable. There's this dude named Jesus and he was your friend. <laughs> and he died for your sins. And he was a wise dude. And while he was at the Sermon on the Mount, he gave this presentation about talking about this house, right? And it wasn't just any house, but it's a really long scripture, and I'm not going to get into that. What we're actually going to do is, is we're going to do a paraphrased, a paraphrased parable, which is an Alex Trebek thing, so this could be on Jeopardy. And that is, is that a wise man builds his house on rock, and when bad comes, the house won't fail. But a foolish man builds his house on sand, and when bad comes, the house crashes down. So the concept here is, is that if you want to do it, the trick is you don't want to be foolish sand, okay? You want to make sure that you're being wise and you're building your, your software on a strong foundation. So this is what I'm talking about with the whole uh, the title of the talk and where it's going. For the visual learners out there, because I know that reading is kind of hard, <coughs> this is good <laughs> and this is bad. <laughs> So I know what you're saying. You're probably asking yourself, what does Jesus have to do with software? Well, being the first software developer, <laughs> just kidding. So basically, what Jesus' point was is that a strong foundation means survival, right? As long as you have this foundation that's entirely sound, then your application will be sound. Let's go to an analogy. Let's talk about whenever cars first started getting produced in the United States. So back in the early 1900s, Henry Ford, Mercedes, all these guys started producing these cars. And back then, the challenge was that car makers were craftsmen. Every single aspect of the car was built by one dude. And they didn't even have the concept of production lines. One guy would basically sit there and he would just start putting a car together. And these two cars that were built by the same company would actually be different because each part was custom made. Every single part was custom manufactured and made for this car. Oh, are you shaking your head? Okay. So the, the challenge here is that there's no standards. You could have two cars from the same company, and they're very, very different inside of this stuff. Now, the way that things work is they work much, much differently. Car makers are system integrators. Each uh, inside of the company, there's people that are responsible for one aspect of the car, and they make sure that that one single aspect is incredibly good. They then share that across all of these different production lines where multiple models from the same company will use that one part, and they're very, very good. Each one is completely designed separately and it's reused across these, across these things. There's a standard process where I can say, I expect this input to happen and I will give you this output. And that's the way these parts are made. And they're very, very optimized as these single points of systems. Applications back then, right, they were designed the same way, that the way the cars were. By this way, this image is copyrighted, so nobody take it, okay? There's a, there's a subtle joke there if you know who this person is. <laughs> that's right. So just to let you know, this image is actually copyrighted. That's why I, I saw it and I was like, this is hilarious. I'm stealing this image. So um, <laughs> back in Richard Stallman's day, hackers coded everything, right? Every single aspect of the application was developed by one person. And this one person was responsible for that. What, what that means is that each function was individually coded. And there was no concept of reusable code. Um, you would code the same exact wheel that someone else would code. And so over time, people started saying, why are we doing this? Why don't we just code one thing, a standard library, and let's use that across this entire system. Applications now are much different. There are these amalgamations of software. 
Um, we use lots of different components. We're sharing this stuff between systems, et cetera. And there's this uh, thing that Picasso said is, is that good developers borrow and great developers steal, right? Um, because of all of these different systems that are out in the world, we basically are consistently borrowing and reusing all this code. Um, Stack Exchange is a great example, is that I guarantee you if you start going to Stack Exchange and just start copying code and searching your code base for those examples, you will find them. Because it's a way that uh, developers can share these uh, snips of code uh, across their organization. So we've created these standard, uh, standard patterns and processes. There's um, uh, developing patterns that we use to say this is exactly, if you're going to build a authentication, app, uh, authentication for an application, this is how you build it, right? So it's done the same exact way, and we reuse code a lot. Um, GitHub is a great example of the way that code's getting reused now. <clears throat> Applications that I look at, they'll have 300 or 400 pieces of direct dependency software that they're using. And so what I start asking you guys is I start saying, you know, how are we starting to look at those pieces of code? This concept of my entire code base is mine, that's not true anymore. So here's the first takeaway. <clears throat> the first takeaway is, is that your product contains other part, others' parts. Excuse me. So what I'm saying here is, is that you're down with OPP. <laughs> and what I mean by that is you're down with other people's parts. So, um, the people that laughed are, are older than the people that didn't laugh. <laughs> so backing up again, let's go back to this question. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the first O for is for other. How do you keep your third party libraries patched? How are we going about doing that? Well, when I ask this question to people, there's typically two attitudes. The first attitude is, well, we don't use third party libraries. I don't think that's necessarily true because I do think that you actually use third party libraries and I think that you use them so much in fact that uh, a paper by Aspect Security came out and said when they analyzed code bases, 80% of the code uh, was third party libraries. Okay, So the majority of your application is third party libraries. They're not even your code base. But when we're doing scans and code audits and stuff, what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at custom code bases. We're not looking at this 80% of software that we're using. Now you may say, you may also still have the Don Draper attitude of, well, we don't use third party libraries. Well, Gartner released a study that said that 90% of software runs, 90% uh, of business critical software runs on open source software. So we are using this code, and you're using this code you know, across your organization. So my response to this is, don't be foolish sand, right? You don't want to build your house on a, uh, a not a very good foundation. <clears throat> You'll keep seeing this foolish sand come up throughout this thing. So if I say to you, don't be, you guys will say foolish sand back. The second attitude is, rather than saying, well, we don't use third party libraries, the second attitude is, I don't know. I don't know whether I'm using that open source or not. Well, that's ignorance. If you're saying, I don't really care about that, and if you're a developer or a security person, it really doesn't matter. Even if you're a CEO of a company, you should, be, you should be caring about how you're, uh, how you're using this third-party library code. So if you're ignorant, well, ignorance leads to things, right? Being ignorant about something is not good. It's typically looked at as a negative thing. I'm ignorant about a lot of things. I don't really see it as being uh, necessarily bad. But ignorance does mean that you have no current visibility into, into that, that code. And if you don't have current visibility, well, then that means that you have unknown threats, right? And unknown threats across large pieces of code base lead to very, very bad things. So you don't want that type of, uh, of unknown threat against a large portion of your code base. But it's OK. You know, everything is OK with doing that. You basically just want to ask your developers a bunch of questions and say, you know, are we using this code? How are we using this code? Um, you know, what type of stuff are we using? So again, what you have to say is if you have this attitude of, I don't know, you don't want to be foolish sand, right? Stop being foolish sand, just ask some questions. So the second takeaway is that other parts, others' parts aren't being monitored, okay? We've already explained that you're using these, these, uh, these third-party codes, but um, you're not really monitoring that third-party code or what that code's doing. Now, I'm not talking about open source licensing. Most people, whenever I ask them, 
so what kind of open source are you using? They're like, oh, well, we have, BS, we have BSD license, MIT license. I'm like, that's not what I'm asking you. Like, that's the business reason as to why you care about whether you're using open source. Because you can't just turn around and sell that if you have, uh, you know, uh, GPL licenses in your software. You have to open source it. I don't care about that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is I'm talking about the third party updates to your code. When those third party libraries are getting updated, how do you know about that stuff? And if you start thinking about this from a security standpoint, as security practitioners, we do a bunch of code reviews. But every single person that I've ever asked if they've done, and I'm not saying like there's been one exception. Every person I've asked if they've done a code review, I ask them, are you looking at the application libraries? Are you looking at what they're doing? They never look at that. They're like, I'm looking at their custom code bases. Well, hopefully I've convinced you that 80% of your code base is this third party library stuff. So you're not even looking at a large portion of their application, you're looking at the custom stuff, right? Management is measuring. You can't measure, you can't uh, measure any, you can't know what's being changed unless you measure it. And the challenge here is, is that unless you even start looking at those code bases, you don't even know what's affecting your application. So let's go back to that car analogy. <coughs> Defective parts are recalled. If uh, my Prius, my 2005 Prius has, a, has a, um, a recall, the dealership will call me and they'll say, hey, you know, your 05 has a bad system modulator. I'm not a car person, so I apologize. But uh, you know, you have this bad modulator thing. And I say, okay, and they say, bring your car in and we'll replace it. I say, okay, great. So they have a very good system of saying, here's how something has changed, please bring it in and let's replace it. But the challenge is, is that how do you know when your parts are being recalled? You know, if you're not monitoring all of this 80% of your application, how do you know that this stuff has changed? And so what ends up happening is, is that you have no visibility. You have no visibility because you're not monitoring it, right? Management is measuring. And so if you have no visibility, well, that leads to problems. That leads to threats. <clears throat> and not just threats, but you have unknown threats. And having unknown threats on a large attack surface causes really bad things to happen because we already know that no visibility leads to really bad things. So don't be foolish sands. So how do we get visibility into third party code, right? Well, you probably need to dedicate somebody on your team to do this um, as part of their job. But the challenge is, is that if you take an entire list of all of the uh, open source software and all of the third party libraries that you use, and you say, okay, well, we have this huge list of software. Let's start going through, I found the first one. Let me go to that website and I'm going to now look at uh, which version's been updated. Okay, I know that. Okay, great, now let me go to the second part. When I was at Symantec, we used 350 pieces of open source. By the time I was at the very end of the list, it's been six weeks, and I gotta go back to the top of the list again. So the problem is, it's not a part-time job, it's a full-time job. This takes an entire person's team to dedicate it. But there's a trick, pro tip, just outsource it to somebody, right? So that's my vendor pitch. <laughs> Take away three. You need to update the other parts you use, know the other parts that you use. Knowing that there's this software that's, that's out there that you're using, the challenge isn't just monitoring, it's okay, well how do we now uh, update it? So why do you care about updating? Well, we've already established that you use other people's parts, right? Those parts are the foundation. So as I talked with this, you know, this, this parable earlier of a foolish man builds his house on sand and a wise man builds his house on, on rock, you're not building your house on rock right now. You're building your house on sand. And that underlying foundation, if it's not strong, you're going to crumble. So the, tr the question is, is what happens whenever the foundation actually changes? My slides kind of talk themselves, so it's OK sometimes. So the answer is, is it depends. So it depends on what you do, right? We're security people. We need to make sure, going back to that earlier point, that we're optimizing the right thing, right? If we're starting to say, okay, well, let's just go about, let's do this, let's do it this one way, it may work, it may not. If your application uses you know, version 1.0, what happens when 1.7 is released, right? You have to write some type of thing that says, okay, well, if the newest version is lib 1.7, what do we do? Well, you have to ask yourself, what's changed between these versions? If your application depends on 1.0, 1.7 is the new version, all of these things, what's the bulk of the data? What is it? Can you benefit from it? 
You know, how do you know? Well, you have to kind of go through and you have to look at every single aspect of that. You have to say, does, you know, does 1.7, is that the most beneficial? Maybe it's 1.4. You know, as long as we get to 1.4, we're okay. When I start talking to people about this, especially security folks, we start saying, well, can I just update everything? Can I just, you know, okay, well, we have all the software that's out of date. Let's just go through and let's just update it all. I see a dude in the back already shaking his head. Yeah, sure. <laughs> go for it. You can do that. I can guarantee you, <laughs> I can guarantee you that bad things are going to happen from that, right? You are going to end up having a worse, uh, a worse time by trying to update everything than actually just figuring out the very specific versions that you need to get to, right? Now, if you don't kill yourself, then there's somebody else, you know, in your group that's going to kill you. And so the challenge is, is that you have to be able to take all of the information that you have and condense that down to a very small consumable portion and give that back to your developers in order to update that code. The challenge is, and the reason why your developers will kill, will kill you or you will kill yourself, is because updates can break things, right? If you sit there and you say, okay, I have this update that I want to do and I'm going to go ahead and update this code base, well, it can potentially break your code. And I say can, but what I actually mean is, is it's going to break your code base. I guarantee you any type of update that you do from a third party library, something will stop working. Hopefully you have a pretty good code, uh, hopefully you use TDD and BDD practices inside of your organization, so you have a very large set of Test, uh, tests that you can run against your application, which is not really, in my experience, what happens. But if you do, then you can rub, run this subset of tests against your apps to make sure, or your, uh, your, your app to make sure it still works the way it's intended. And the reason this happens is, is because those APIs that you're currently using, something in it has been deprecated. You're using some functionality that they've decided this doesn't really work the right way, and so let's just remove that functionality. And so even though they fixed a security issue in 1.4. They may have also deprecated something that you're using. And so there becomes this challenge and this constant fight with security people of how do we go about doing this the right way. Well, the thing is, is that from a security standpoint, you have to concern yourself with making sure that the security of your application is strong. If your developers have built something that the newer version fixes something that you are using that secured it, but in another thing, the same, uh, another uh, part of it is actually using a piece that's been deprecated. As a security person, it's your job to convince the person, let's update that new stuff and let's find something else to use this deprecated piece of code. Or let's remove it. The challenge is that every single update that comes out is completely different, right? And again, you need to make sure that you're optimizing the right thing. If you're updating every, everything across the board, you're not optimizing the right thing. You're convincing your developers, hey, just update everything and let's deal with the fallout later. You're not saying, hey, what I actually care about is I care about two things. I care about security and I care about performance. The security aspect your developers don't really care about, but the performance aspect they do. So if you can say to them, hey, just to let you know this, this thing that fixes this security issue also fixes this performance update that has less memory leakage, you know, et cetera, et cetera, they're going to be more inclined to do it. How to win friends and influence people, it's all about convincing people that they want to do what it is that you want to do, right? Tom Sawyer, convince them that it's in their best interest to paint the fence, <laughs> right? So that's kind of how you go about doing this. So we're back to this question. How do you keep your third party libraries patched? And so now that I've given you all this information of how you should patch your libraries, hopefully you won't say, we're, using, we're not using third-party libraries. You'll say, actually, a large portion of our code is using third-party libraries. And how do you go about you know, updating that? I don't know. We're not even monitoring it, right? So let's review. Three points. One, your product contains other people's parts. Two, other parts aren't being monitored. And three, you should update others' parts for use, right? So anything that you use, if an update comes out, Make sure you update it. For the visual learners, <laughs> this is good. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's, funny, it's funny that you say that because I actually debated on whether you're using that or not because of that. But this is, this is good. This is bad. Don't be foolish, Sand. 
build it on a strong foundation. That's it. Thanks, guys. So I have 20 minutes left, so if you guys want to ask questions, feel free. That was 140 slides, so I must go through them really fast. How to go about doing it? Yeah. So I actually did have it. I removed it because I thought I was going to go long. So the question is, my battery's low. Um, the question is, how do you actually do this? How do you go about doing it? So there's kind of, uh, so there's four ways you can go about doing it. The first is you don't do it at all. Hopefully I've established that that's the bad way to do it. Yeah, <laughs> check. Step one down. Um, the second way is that you can use a spreadsheet. That's pretty common um, in what I found is, is people will say, well, I have a spreadsheet to do this. We have a process in place. I see a guy in the back that's with Black Duck too, so he, he knows what I'm talking about. So the challenge with the spreadsheet concept is that um, unless you have a really strong process in place that your developers actually follow, they will add a piece of open source software and you now have no visibility into that. So the problem with the spreadsheet is, is that although it's a good way to do the enumeration and get kind of like a first step in place, unless you can really convince developers to change the way they're currently doing the process, that's not the right way to do it. But you can do it that way. And you know what? That's better than not doing it at all. The, uh, the next step is you can build a custom application in-house. Um, there's a challenge with doing that. I've talked to a lot of companies that do this. Um, there's a small startup in Mountain View that does search, search engine stuff, I guess. And they have a custom application. Um, the challenge with building a custom application is if I was to ask you, OK, what we care about is we care about security updates to our software. You would say, hey, I got an idea. Let's base it off the National Vulnerability Database. The challenge with doing that is, is that uh, developers themselves don't know how to file a CVE. If, they, if, somebody, if some piece of code that you're using uses GitHub and you use that, you're never going to find a CVE vuln that's been fixed in some third party app or some third party library. What they're going to do is they're just going to fix the code and they're going to push it. The problem is, is that if you're basing your entire application on the NVD, there's a lot of false negatives you're not going to see because of the way they go about doing the updates. Um, what we've done is, uh, and I hate, sorry, this is kind of like Vendry, but the way what we've done is, is that we actually go through and look at commit messages and we actually start looking for things other than CVE to see if they've actually fixed things um, to go through and, and do it that way. And that's, that's what we believe is the right way to go about it. And that's what you do internally from yourself or that's, the, that's an offering? That's an offering that we have, yeah. That's in fact what our product does. So, um, so, that's, so even if you build a custom application, the thing you have to think about is, well, how many false negatives? And it's actually really interesting. Um, we want to publish something on this, but the more data that we get, the more we're like, oh, the numbers changed even more. Um, you'd be really surprised with how many, uh, how many of the times something is fixed that does not have a CVE responsible for it. And it's a, I mean, it's a lot. You're looking at like 80-20, right? So that's, those are ways to go about doing it. Um, so even, and, and, and by the way, even if you do build a custom application, like having something tied to the NVD, like at the very minimum, that's at least something that you're doing, right? And so there is very small steps that you can do just to start doing that. Yeah, so, um, so the question is, is that we're, uh, how do you deal with the dependency hell uh, that you, you boil down into when you start doing this stuff? So what I'm more concerned with is that, so I agree with you, and, the, and there's also a follow-up question to that is, um, how do you care about vulnerabilities that are undiscovered yet in this open source software? How do you do that, right? The thing is, is that we're trying to drive Ferraris before we even know how to drive, right? We need to kind of take these very small steps first. The first step is, are we even checking the stuff? And if we are, can we make sure that the stuff that's known about, we're patching? Like, that's the big thing, right? These unknown threats, like this kind of thought, once you have visibility into it, it's like, great. And then it's like, OK, now that we have a good process in place for that, let's step this next thing. With dependency hell, um, what we do is, uh, with our application, you can do this. So there's two types of dependencies. I don't know how technical with developing everybody's in the room, but basically you have two types of dependencies. You have direct dependencies and indirect dependencies. When you, your application is specifically using something, that's a direct dependency. When one of your dependencies use something, that's an indirect dependency. Dependency hell is what happens when you start using all these things and the versioning problems that starts happening. When 
a dependency that you use requires 1.1, but you require 1.3, which one should you use, et cetera. So we don't do any of that yet. That's kind of all handled typically by the, the, by the um, developers of the app. Um, but a lot of modern frameworks, if you use things, like if you're on Java, if you use Maven, that kind of handles it for you. If you use Rails, Bundler actually handles that for you. If you use Node.js, um, NPM uses that for you. So a lot of the modern frameworks are kind of leveraging and starting to do this. Um, so older frameworks, if you use C++, good luck. Like, Yeah, okay, so uh, with, you mean like with discovering what it is? Okay, so the question is, um, is it better or worse if it's uh, dynamically linked versus statically linked? So <laughs> without having the conversation about licensing, <laughs> all right, um, the trick is, is that most modern frameworks, you can do introspection to actually know whether uh, what's actually being used. And as soon as you do that introspection, even if it's dynamically linked, it kind of knows that it's there. So with doing that, that's how we go about doing Discover. We actually tie into the application and we actually go look and say, hey, what is it that you would use? What is it everything that you can use? And give us those versions back and it, it does. Um, but with that, like if you're statically linking, clearly that's gonna be the easiest way to do it if you wanna build something in house. Um, if you want to do dynamic linking, you obviously have to do like, uh, you have to, uh, when you load up the application, start asking the application questions in order to get all that data back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me drink a beer first, hold on. Aaron, this is what I was talking about, by the way. So, um, so Closed source, <laughs> so closed source has the same challenges, like especially if you use like Oracle, that's a great example. Um, so the challenge is, is that at least Oracle has ways to distribute that information to the people that care, right? If, you, you, if you're paying Oracle, they will call you <laughs> because they wanna sell you more stuff next year, and they'll say, hey, just to let you know, there's this update that's available. So typically closed source systems have better communication channels. The problem with using open source software is that we're very good at Open source in general as a community is very good at building stuff. We're very good at uh, patching stuff. We're not very good at telling people who use our stuff, hey, there's this update, patch it, <laughs> right? So um, that the closed source community, they're incentivized to do that because they're paid to do that, right? Um, it's something that like we as a company, we've like started looking into, but that's like way far away. Anyway, anything else? Yeah. Situation where you get at some point they realize their house is built on sand, they built stilts, and they get to a point of no return. <laughs> so, for instance, we have a client, they they were out, they had a remote code execution. We told them you update your struts, that it. at some point they built all these extensions onto it, and they've gone to this point where it's just not worth their time or effort to revert that all back out sure. so they can update struts to get them where they want to be. So, so, so the question is, is if you, if, if somebody that is using uh, or, or starts uh, realizing they need to update and rather than actually updating, they build a bunch of custom code to handle all the stuff, how do you deal with that? So I don't know, <laughs> to be honest. <coughs> There's actually a company that's fairly large that I guarantee you every person in this room probably uses called Red Hat that does exactly that. Um, every single uh, security fix that comes out, what they do is they do backporting, right? So um, for those of you that don't know, uh, what ends up happening is, is that libpng comes out with, or actually Apache is a better example. Apache comes out and the version of Apache, uh, some vulnerabilities found and they say, okay, great. So rather than Apache 1.34, 1.341's fixed this phone. Well, the problem is, is that the way Red Hat does is they look at the code base and they say, okay, we see what's changed from this vulnerability concept. Let's just copy and paste that code into the version that we have, but let's not increment the number. And the reason why they do that is, is because they're responsible to make sure that that code works across all systems when people do this update. When they update, they wanna make sure that it works. That whole entire thing I was talking about, about uh, making sure that your stuff doesn't break, Red Hat does that for you with this kind of stuff. Okay. So the challenge there is that, I'll get, I'll get to you in a second. The challenge is, is that when that happens, if you take a vulnerability management product and you start scanning this stuff, 
you'll get a bunch of false positives because the way that they're doing fingerprinting is they're asking the server, what version are you using? And then it says, I'm using 134. And they're like, that's two and a half years old. Look at all these vulnerabilities you're susceptible to, right? So that, that's the problem. So if you build on stilts, the challenge is, is that you've now built this other level of, um, of abstraction that you have to now get around. Um, so it's kind of your job as a consultant to convince them, guys, this isn't the right way to do it. Let's rip this out. Let's update stuff and let's deal with that fallout then. Sometimes, uh, if there's a third party package that's not what happens um, is that some security fix doesn't build into their um, system. So they will modify it or just drop it and don't tell the upstream. So upstream is sure that it's fixed. And that, that ships the version that says it's fixed and it's not fixed. And until somebody like uh, is broken into with this version or something like that happens, nobody knows about it. Because upstream usually doesn't check what that happens. If Red Hat is not active in communicating uh, to upstream, that happens. Yeah, so you're saying if... So we had actually uh, uh, had the patches dropped from uh, not from Red Hat, but from other patches distributed because they just had a problem with build and they decided to just drop it. And they didn't give it to no, nobody knows, like nobody knows why. Like we asked them, why, why didn't you tell? Well, well, we had, uh, we wanted to, but somehow it didn't work out. Nobody knows why. That yeah. So the, the what he was saying is, is that. Uh, Red Hat fixes something, but they don't let Upstream know how they fixed it, and so Upstream doesn't get it put in. And how do you deal with that yeah, kind of stuff? Yeah. The problem is, is that that's just a communication problem, right? I, I think. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Debian has that problem a lot, actually. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm scared of your question. Go ahead. What about out of band patches? <laughs> so we have a way to address it. <laughs> Sorry, the question was how do you deal with out of band patching? Yeah, that, that's true. Client A makes software products. The software product has a bug in it introduced by dependency. Dependency is made by you know, company B. For whatever reason, you can't make company B fix the problem, so you fix it yourself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. That's much different than I thought, so I'm glad you clarified that. So, um, the, the question was uh, Company A makes a product. Uh, that they use company or they use product B as a dependency. Um, you find that there's a problem in product B. You talk to company A. Company A says, "Okay, let's just fix that." And so then they patch product B. Right? It's a custom code that you're not. Basically, the concept is: what happens about patches that aren't contributed back to the community? How do you benefit from that? Right? Well, unfortunately, the way that licensing structures work, if you're using MIT, you're totally able to fork something, do it yourself, and not contribute back. Right? Um, it's interesting you brought that up because I actually talked about that at one point and I removed it because like this is going way too into the grass. Um, so if a company themselves benefit from a dependency, they should feel inclined to contribute back even if the license doesn't say they have to, right? Um, I understand if it's something that's very uh, IP specific to the company, but if it's something that others can benefit from, like a security patch, they should contribute that back, right? If it's what? Yeah, oh, so the company prohibits it from doing that, like Apple. Um, so <laughs> uh, unfortunately, you can't deal with. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Those are my words. Yeah, yeah, I understand. There's only a couple of companies that do that. Um, so if that is the case, because they don't want to obviously, um, they don't want to let the world know that they're using that as you know what they're based on. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it, right? I. I Again, like that's one of those things that's like, oh, if we get this first thing down, then the next thing would be awesome. That's one of those next things. Like, let's just get the basic stuff down before we start figuring it out. Yeah. Irish, do I, am I done on time? Or It says I have four minutes. No, no, I have like seven seconds. One minute, he says. Billy, do you have any questions? Did your daughter enjoy my presentation? Oh, by the way, you missed the best slide. Go ahead. Do you have a question? work at Microsoft and make 
you get this in there, it sucks. <laughs> you just hire Brett to do it for you. So what you're saying is, is Microsoft uses open source software? That's weird. This, this slide was for you, but you weren't here yet to see this. All right, well, thanks, guys. I, I'll be around if you guys want to ask something. Thanks. Drink. All right.